two guys come out from behind the car. Pulled a gun out and I was like, fuck you, you better fuck kill me. And I got shot in the stomach. The guy put the gun to my head and it jammed up. I remember running left and right and I could feel the pain in my stomach. I knew I'd been shot. And as I hit the corner and my whole left of my body went. I said to my brother, I got upstairs in my drawer. There's an eight ball of sniff. You're sat there, you've been shot and you're banging lines of coke. Yeah, put some water inside a super mop bottle, put tissue on the top of it, lit the tissue up like that. Old Bill come flying around the corner. You're lucky you got back on the right path. It took me 15 years. <laughs> yeah, but listen, some, some people don't do it. What's going on guys? This video is sponsored by Louis. Some of you know him on Insta as Loads. One of the best Instagram names, let me tell you that. Guys, Louis has been building online businesses for the last five to 10 years and he has spent the last five years coaching others one-to-one -one on how to start businesses. Louis has got over 2,000 profitable testimonials. And guys, let me be honest with you. I wouldn't let someone sponsor the show who I didn't vouch for. So trust me, it's legit. Literally, just go send him a DM on Instagram. It's at Loads. All you gotta do is say to him, I come from the Blue Tick Show, help me make some money. And I know most of these people out there scams and there's plenty of people out there offering you millions and millions of pounds and stuff like that. Louis is one of the 1% who actually do it properly. Legitly, you don't need nothing. All you literally need is a phone and Wi-Fi. Send him a message and leave the rest to him. Guys, and if you want to know why I'm sitting here pushing it so much, it's because realistically, doing a nine to five ain't going to get you nowhere. And I know most people sit here and say this because they're getting some sort of commission for it and stuff like that, but I really ain't. I'm telling you as a good person, the host of the show, doing a nine to five ain't going to get you nowhere. So go message Louis, say you come from the boutique show, just ask Louis for the business model, let him do the explaining and let him explain to you how he can help you. I'll see you soon. What's going on guys and welcome back to the Blue Tick Show, the world's fastest growing show. I'm your host Mikey and opposite me today I've got Barry O'Shea. Barry, you got shot in the stomach and was paralysed? That's yes. a mad intro. Welcome to the show my brother. Welcome. Well listen, how are you firstly? I'm good. Got up here right. Yeah? Good. yeah? How was the journey? Journey was good. Got a nice, it's a nice area. Oh look, I'll tell you how I like to do my podcasts. You might have done them before but I like to take mine back to your childhood. I like to learn a little bit about baby, <laughs> baby you. So explain to us your upbringing, who you was, where you're from, the whole lot. I was born um, and we lived in Mozart State. I don't know if you know that state in London, uh, West London, quite central. Um, born, two brothers, one sister. Uh, brought up, normal childhood. Um, common, not much, but enough to get ahead, just like most normal families from the area where I was brought up. Um, struggled a little bit going through. I was very, very shy growing up. Um, went to a normal school was actually in a pretty bad school, primary school called Queen's Park, and then my mum saw that I had potential to put me into a better primary school, and I've done well from there, really. I think primary schools make a massive difference, believe it or not. Do when you think I, so? when, I, Do you know what it is? It sounds so weird, but when I went to secondary school, I went to like a proper, just basic primary school, and when I went to secondary school, everyone was smarter than me. And I was like, yeah, what school do you like? I see you not learn so much more, what was that? But no, I suppose primary school, listen, it's your start, it's your journey. It's where you first started. It must make a difference. Do you know what it was? When I was young, no one um, no one really helped me with my homework or anything. Or anything. So I sort of be able to get things done myself. I come home and I wouldn't allow anyone to help me anyway. And I'm one of the people, if you put something in front of me, I'll get it done until it until it's complete. I think my mum must have noticed that I had quite I was quite intelligent from a young age. So trying to get me into a better primary school. And I got into a better primary school. And then from there, I got into probably one of the best schools in the UK. Oh, really? School. Yeah, I got really uh, got good grades in my SATs. Back then it was sats. I think you get like five, five, five. But I got like sixes. I put got into an extension oh, bloody hell. test and got into um. Yeah, I think well, Tony Blair's sons went to my school, London Oratory, no, in Chelsea. Don't need to throw names out there. Yeah? <laughs> <laughs> well, he was prime minister at the time, right? Yeah, so, no, fair so, enough. So, fair so, enough. So, so for me to get into a school like that, it's a different level. My mum was extremely, extremely proud to me to get into a school like that. And what was secondary school like? Do you know what it was mad because I thought I was smart, right? And I got into this school and they put me in an average class, and I was like. How, how's that possible like I'm smart and I looked around thinking this can't be right so by the time I got to year 9 I got put into I made higher. myself get into all the higher classes and everything but at first I was 6 months into school and I wanted to leave because all these kids are all like really posh kids come from money I come from nothing like uh, not I say broken back on but mum and dad there to support me but not always there all the time do you know what I mean and it was like so I was sort of left to my own devices, you know what I mean? In my area, everyone drinks, everyone goes out partying on the weekend to enjoy themselves. So you sort of, I mean, I was just sort of doing what I wanted. So I got to this school and it was like completely different. And I thought all these kids were like younger than me. I thought it was all immature, but it wasn't. I was very grown up for my age. So I'm in there, all these kids are like talking about going and 
watching little Nicky at, at the cinema with their parents. I'm sitting there thinking, my pals just burgled a house. You know what I mean? My pals were in the blocks and they smoking crack. Do you know what I mean, we're 11, 12 years old. Well, I thought I was a big man back then, but I wasn't. I've seen the photos of me now. I was only a youngster. But I thought about it. And then the school said to me, why don't you try and join the rugby team? And I'm quite competitive. So I joined the rugby team and that's when it all changed for me, really. What changed? I started socialising more with the people in the school. I realised that these people was all quite academic and smart and wanted to do well. It wasn't there wasn't it's not like a normal secondary school like we had a we had a swimming pool. Oh for real? You like money money. We had a yeah, we had a swimming pool in our school, yeah. So I'm trying to remember I was, I was a good swimmer as well. We had a swimming pool in our school, we had our own chapel. It was um teachers some of the some of the teachers had master wore like robes. It was oh, uh, yeah, it was, it was quite hard, isn't it? But if for for a, a school that's public and not private, it was ran like a private school. I've been up to, to up this area before, um, to play rugby with some of the top schools. Oh yeah. And it was really good to um to have that sort of level of discipline and they teach about self discipline. It's great because it's worked for me later on in life. Just to touch on, you said your friends were robbing houses in the block smoking crack and stuff like that. Were you never involved in that? No, I was always there, but I was always like at the back of the back of the group. My brother would always be in front of everyone. Like the area was sort of like as we got older, everyone sort of come together. But there was a lot going on, man. People robbing cars, houses, people taking drugs. It was nuts, and I see it all from young, and it's just natural for everyone to do that. Was your brothers involved in it? No, not at a young age. Not a young age. A bit more of a menace than me. Do you know what I mean? If honest you, I was quite bullied as a child, man. Watching my brother get really? bullied as well. Yeah, quite oh, held wow. back from old, older boys in the area, and it was like um. I had a lot of hate towards people when I was young. So I would always be that shy person in the back, you know what I mean? It's probably why I ended up becoming the person i become, because I don't want to be that shy person in the corner, do you know what I mean? Like, like most people who are gangsters, I don't really... Uh, most of them got a pretty bad story of how they grew up. I think, I think everyone has a, a story in their own right, and your story today could be the craziest story someone's ever heard. It all depends on how it hits that viewer as well. Yeah, well, it's everyone's gauge on life, right? 100%. So I mean, some, some, some man's rich as another man's poor. Everyone sees things differently, isn't it? Hundred percent. But what changed for you? Obviously, we're here today because your life's not as good as it all sounds. There, that sounds lovely. You sound like what you did on my show. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Stuff changed. Yes. Stuff got a little bit wrong, should we say? Yeah, hundred percent. Where was the first turning point? Um, my mum moved up to Chelsea, West Kensington, so so that I could be closer to the school. I used to walk to school back. I mean, I was I was doing a paper round, working at Chelsea Football Ground. Like working to earn money, I was taught that you have to work to earn money and worked really hard as young. From 14 onwards, I was working hard. But then my mum and dad went separate ways and my mum moved back to the old area. Okay. So now I've moved back down the old area. And when I moved back down the area, I got no discipline there from my Mum and dad separated? Yeah. Okay. So I moved back to the old area and got basically back around the old area. And by the time, this time now, I was in year 10 and I realised that you can make money from selling drugs. So I basically started using that in my school. How old was you when your mum and dad split? Um, they was always back and forth, but it must have been, I was in year 10, so about 14. Do you reckon that had an effect on you? I sort of left to my own, do what I want then. I'm not really that much disciplined anymore. You know, you're sort of becoming a man, so do my own thing. Do you know what I mean? Why are they saying it? If you, if you ain't got a father figure there, some other someone else will become that father figure that you look up to. Definitely. And that's exactly basically what happened, really. And when you went out and you was being a little bit reckless, what did that involve? Well, basically, I started, to, I was still trying to, I was very entrepreneurial from a young age. I sort of realised that you can make money from selling drugs. I'd buy a piece of like, ash for 20 quid from someone in the area. But was you ever involved in that thing? Because, do you know what I mean? As in, there's always that good kid in the in the, in the the block. Was you that kid? Uh, my, as, I got, as I got older, I developed developed as into, into fucking madness, man. Violence, okay, a lot fair. of violence. And <laughs> fair but at a young age, for me, it was all, all about money, man. Do you know what I mean? I wanted what these rich kids had in my school. I want to see them all with money. You know what I mean, I come from one of the deprived background, but we didn't have much anyway. Yeah. So I started thinking, right, I can make money. So I was always like, as I said, working, to, doing a paper round for two years, Chelsea Football Ground, and I started realising you can make money from drugs. So I just bought like twenty pounds worth of ash, bring it to school, chop it into ten pieces, and make um, make two hundred quid. You know what I mean, so and I thought thinking this is and they've all right. Got, they've all got money in school, so they're all ready to pay. And I, and I was quite academically smart, right? I got into all the top sets. I got all GCSEs. I got nine GCSEs, all above C. So I started thinking, I can use my academic brain in my area, which people ain't that smart. <laughs> so drugs, The smartest right? drug dealer yeah, in the end. that's what I thought I'd that, do. That's the know. title, interviewing the smartest drug dealer. Mate, and, and basically, by the time I was 17, I had it all, man. I was, I, had, mate, I was doing, I, I know I shouldn't really gloat about it and glamorise it because I don't anymore, but from drugs, I done pretty well from a young age. You know what I mean? I, I had people running, running for me and everything at a young age, I know, but I was big, so I looked like I was older than what I was. 
But basically, I just chose the wrong trade, man. Groomed by the young, wrong people in the area, looking up to all the gangsters and people sending drugs. Remember, I'm in an area where everyone does things wrong and the people who've got money and robbing and licking boxes and doing this and doing that is seen as a good thing. But the truth is... How much was you making at a young age? Mate, at 17, I could move a box a week of cocaine at one point. Oh, Quite really? Yeah, so you're making yeah. good money? Yeah, and I, I, but I just I started sniffing. Started sniffing at 17, had a relationship break up and just went downhill from there. <laughs> Is that where it all changed? Yeah, as soon as I started taking, taking. I remember going to a nightclub, Caesars on Old Kent Road, with a couple of the older boys from the area that was like already serving up and it was a privilege for me to be even hanged around with them who I looked up to. They was, they was like, yeah, the, the gangsters from the, the area. The big boys. Yeah. So I got in there and then I come back and tell all the boys from my area who I used to see as above me but now they're all looking up to me and I thought, yeah, this is it, man. This is my lifestyle. Do you know what I mean? This is all I want to be. I was in, in the club, drinking. I didn't sniff then, but I sniffed afterwards. But I thought, this is it, man. This is the life I want. I thought, this is it. Everyone getting attention from girls. So now I'm not that little shy kid anymore. I'm it, innit? I thought thinking, is it? I'm getting yeah. attention from girls. People looking at me. I'm making money from drugs. Got people phoning me. My phone doesn't stop ringing. I thought I was it. Do you know what I mean? So I left school. I started selling drugs, but now I started sniffing. And then from there to 21. They always say, down. don't get high on your own supply. They do, yeah. They, they always say that. When you started sniffing, did your the respect for you go down? Is in the boys you had working for you. We I had a conversation with my friend about it the other day, and he said, "Mikey, he goes, I drink a lot." He goes, and he owns his own business. He goes, when I'm out with the staff and I'm drinking, he goes, I wake up the next morning, I think, fuck me, they're all thinking I'm an alcoholic. And when you have these boys running for you and you're sitting there getting on the packet and stuff, don't you think are these guys respecting me if I'm on the packet? Do you know what? Uh, a lot of them used to be on it with me, but at the same time, it was it was it did yeah, mate. Every, if you're you're in that industry, it's very hard to like the ones who who I see do well don't take their own stuff. Do you know what I mean? But I started taking it because I couldn't handle relationship breakup and all that. End up sniffing my brains up, and then I'm going from Peter to pay Paul, back and forth from different dealers, and it was just like slowly but surely it was just a downward spiral. Do you know what I mean? I remember I was living in Warwick at one point in a block, and I had like the entire block, man. Like, it's like, you see, New, is it, was it New Jack City? Like, the entire block used to buy. I basically just leave my door open. There'd be knives everywhere. Oh, for real. Money everywhere. Like, I remember my dad come back from Brighton one time. Phoned him up. I'd have been off my nut for like 12 hours, sitting in the house, sniffing, drinking. Phoned my dad and he walked in. He hadn't seen me in a couple of years. And he walked in with, with his wife then. And she, even though she's from the area, she isn't, doesn't really like that sort of lifestyle. She'd moved out and she walked in and it was like, uh, and it was, uh, yeah, my, my, uh, Dad walked in and he was just blown away and he was like, I can make some coffee. He went to open up a coffee tin, big pile of money in there, open up another tin, big pile of money, just sniff all over the table, oh, knives real? everywhere. Was you not ashamed when he saw it? Yeah, he was, I think he took me with him. He took me with him to his house. He was like, come, you're coming with me. Oh, for real? He took me with him I was, and, I, and I was out of it at the time. I went with him and that's when he sort of was brought into the madness of what I'd become, do you know what I mean? From, from going from being this young kid in this great school, getting great results, this entrepreneurial attitude, picking the wrong trade. Now I'm sitting in a room do you know what it is though we look at you today and half the viewers in there are going to be looking at you thinking you were dealing drugs you weren't a drug dealer <laughs> being honest with you I look at you and I'm thinking how is this guy you look like a posh guy you do I'm being honest with you and you think how is he a drug dealer but you know what it is they say that drugs change a person and that's what I guess happened with you you was on a straight and narrow path you took that and it just knocked you straight off your yeah. path and you're lucky you got back on the right path. We'll talk about that later on. But it took me 15 years. <laughs> yeah, but listen, some, some people don't do it. Yeah, yeah, sadly. And when you went back to your dad's house, did he batter you? No, no, my, my, my dad was, because my dad wasn't around, I think he sort of felt like um, <clears throat> when he broke up, my mum wasn't really there. I didn't really come back around the area too much. He didn't want to be around it anyway because he was, he could, he could easily become the person I become. Do you know what I mean? From being around the okay, area. Yeah, yeah. So and his and his friends are very much. A lot of his friends are dead now. Who ended up becoming my friends from drinking and taking drugs. So my dad parted ways. Didn't want to be a part of the area or anything around it. So when he took me took me there, he was my dad was more like my friend growing up. At some time, do you know what I mean? He's he's hundred percent my dad now. I mean, I look yeah. up to him massively. But it was like it took me up there. But I just carried on, man. I mean, I remember one time my dad was in Newcastle, and I went to. Newcastle on Thursday and woke up in Turkey on Wednesday a week later. <laughs> Newcastle? Hold on. So my dad was in um, Newcastle, phoned him up and I was like, right, I'm on the way. It was four o'clock in the morning. I was off my nut again. Craziness. I was like, I'm coming. I picked up, picked up. I didn't think I picked up any clothes or anything. I just grabbed a big bag of drugs, loads of, loads of like tickets, grams of, grams of Charlie, some money in my pocket. Went to King's Cross. I was like, I remember I was on the, on the cab on the way there and I phoned my pal up and I was like, listen, I'm on the way to Newcastle. Tell me right now. Give me some motivation to get me to go there. Because I was shit with my I think I'm going to go back. Like, I was off my nut. I was wired, innit? So I was thinking, he must be, go on, man. You're the man. It's going to be brilliant. I got to King's Cross and I looked. 
the train come. I think at ten past six in the morning, got on the train. It was four hours to Newcastle. I was like, I'm sitting on the train like this. Off your trolley. So old woman sitting next to me, wide awake like that, going to the toilet every two minutes to sniff like that, looking at the clock. Oh my God. For four hours solid, like nuts, absolutely nuts. Got to Newcastle, my dad phoned me. I was like, I said, yeah, I've just landed, I'm in, I'm in Nottingham. And he was like, oh my God, you idiot. And I was like, I'm only joking, I'm in Newcastle, I'm in Newcastle. And the crazy, I'll tell you what, was story ever. I walked up the stairs and there was like um group of girls danced on a table across the road. And I was like, like, like some Hindu. And I was like, yes, this is my place. As I've done, looking over that, a van has drift past, and they've egged me. This video is sponsored by Cranbrook Law, an award-winning immigration law firm. Their talented solicitors can help when any struggles arise regarding immigration law. They can help get you the visas they need. They can help get you the staff you need from any other countries. As you can see, the website is on the screen right now. So if you need anything to do with immigration law, message Cranbrook Law and let them help you. Whether you're looking to obtain a sponsor license, receive advice and guidance in relation to compliance and our civil penalties, or take advantage of our know-how and experience across a broad range of business visas, our talented and dynamic immigration lawyers are available to speak to you. Telephone numbers on the screen, emails on the screen, and hit the link in the bio if you need any help. What? Egg we got egged in the middle of Newcastle. <laughs> in the morning. Wait, off. you got egged for completely nothing. I'm off, I'm off my tits and almost and this is a biggie busy high road. The van <laughs> drove down the road and they egged my dad as well. My dad's come walking towards me. Must have been the only two people in the high road that have been egged. I thought they must have known we're from London or something. <laughs> I swear to him I'll have to then I not well, Welcome not. to Newcastle. <laughs> yeah oh, mate it was crazy. Well I hope it was eggs anyway. It was, it was some some sort of juice. I hope it went or something but anyway I got I got I got fing thrown on me. Went to the hotel, went out that night, then went out another night. Um, with your dad? I went out the first night with my dad. I was still awake from the night before. <laughs> then I ended up going going back, ended up in some mad house party somewhere. It was out with all my dad's friends. And, it, and then I remember being in the toilet with one of them. And I pulled out a load of ticks and it was like, fucking hell, you won the lottery or something. But up in Newcastle, this was like 15 years ago. They wasn't used to someone having lots of, uh, it's quite, it's quite, it's not, it wasn't much yeah, money. Yeah, it, was all, yeah. it was all ecstasy and pills. And, it was, and I was like, no. So I was try they was trying it and then I was going with them. They was like, oh, you need to come with us. I think I ended up with them in a mad house party for a couple of hours. They ended up back at the hotel room. And then I was thinking, f*** this, I'm leaving. I'm going back to London. I went and got the train. My dad from me said, where are you? I said, oh, I'm going back to London. I got on the train. I ended up bumping up, bumping into someone on the train that I knew from Shepherd's Bush. It was the World Cup final. Portugal played in Brazil, I think, or the European Cup final. I can't remember which one it was. It was years ago. And he was like, come around here. I asked him what the score is. He come around here. And he opened up a cup of can. So I've carried on drinking. Then I've got back to London, gone to my house, but now I'm already drinking, so I carried on sniffing. Then I realised we're going to Turkey tomorrow. The family holiday was already booked. So then all my family have gotten like a 16-seater minibus. Um, I don't know if you know Dante Hawkins, the Tottenham. No, I don't. He's done a couple of podcasts. Well, Dante, Dante Hawkins, uh, my pa, he was on the bus, we were singing. I remember that Faithless song come up. <laughs> I can't get no sleep. Then we drove past the And airport. you're still off your face at this point? I'm still going. This is four days later, and this is the Tuesday morning. <laughs> I'm still going. Like, I mean, my mum my mom said to me, Mary, you're not going to get on a plane. Look at the state of you. So I went to the toilet. So was your mum aware of what you was involved yeah, in? Yeah, she knew I was She knew I was She knew I was, <laughs> she knew I, was I went to the toilet and sniffed like a whole eight ball. Just to sober myself up. Then the same thing again. I've got on the aeroplane like that. All stiff, looking up at the ceiling, thinking, oh my God. Then we landed in Turkey and me and Dante are walking around trying to get a kebab. And the horrible thing was, you know, like in, in, in the UK, we have kebab sauce, right? Yeah, yeah. Then all they had was chilies. So I'm looking everywhere to get some, some, hot, some hot food. And then I've... We finally got some food. I fell asleep and I woke up. Oh, it was six. I woke up. So I started opening my eyes and I see Turkish writing on the wall. I didn't know what the writing was. Some foreign writing. I was thinking, where the f am I? The last thing I remember, I was in London in my room for a week ago. Do you know what I mean? So I woke up there on the side of the bed. They're sick everywhere. It's, the most, it's horrible as well. I don't know if it's viewed as air. It's evil. But I myself for a piece what? of drink. Yeah, man. All over me. Do you know what it's like trying to peel off your body with no, no clean stuff. So I'm like that woke up. This is when my drinking was getting bad. And I was like, oh my God, where am I? Vomit everywhere, naked, sitting on the side of the bed. And the worst thing was trying to clean the room with no cleaning. And then I went downstairs. I finally cleaned it all up. And I remember the next day, woman went to me, oh, you have an accident in the room? But I was like, yeah, yeah, I got sick everywhere. <laughs> I was in the big man. Oh, yeah, but that was, that was five day bender. New question on Thursday. So I've always Turkey wanted to Wednesday. understand this. I've always wanted to understand it. Obviously, I, I know people who go on these benders and stuff. How the f*** does your body stay awake for that long? Like, genuinely now, you're five days. I, if I don't go to bed tonight, I'm shattered. Mate, the cocaine just gives you a rush in it. You keep going, you keep on sniffing. And you're just up. You're up, man. That's why, that's why you seem to stay, stay sober. Do you know what I mean, if I didn't sniff, I'd be getting vomit all the time from drink when I used to drink and take drugs. Like, it's, it's nuts. So when I start sniffing, it just keeps you seven. And you're like, you sort of know what's going on around you. You think you do. Yeah. You're alert in it. 
but it's like the truth is you're not really alert. I look, I said, I, I said everything that was going on around me. I look back at the photos of me, and I'm in an absolute state. I think, Fuck. I thought I was all right. <laughs> I but thought I looked good there, mate. I'm in an absolute state. But even, even, but the delusion, the, the delusion part is even when, when you're sober next day, you still think in that laughter that you're all right. Like you can, you're gonna, you're hiding what you're really, yeah. you really you've become a sniffer or a drug addict. Do you know what I mean? But the truth is, it ain't, it ain't no. Secret. How old was you when you went on the family holiday? Um, I must have been 21 then. I think 21, 22. When did things get really bad for you? 2010. First time I went to jail. How old was you? Um, was that thirteen years ago? So I was twenty-three then. Oh, so not you weren't very old. No. Why'd you go to prison? Attempted arson. Attempted um, arson. Yeah. What did you try to burn down? You know, it was I'd riz through the ranks in the in the in the drug world. Saw myself as a bit of a chap. Was you I a was, big boy at this point? Yeah, I, I was. I was the size I am now. No, no, as in money-wise, was you making big dough? Mate, I, do you know what it was? I was, and I weren't. I was perceived to look like I was, but I wasn't because I was sniffing my brains out. Do you know what I mean? And it was always, yeah. it was sort of on a downward spiral. And when you're on a downward spiral. Everything's negative. Do you know what I mean? And it was like somebody come on the phone to me, and I was trying to, I was trying to live up to live up to this this image that I created. Do you know what I mean? You can't fuck with me. I got power, powerful. You know what I mean? As soon as you let some f- take the piss out of you, next minute everyone's on you. Do you know what I mean? And and that happened to me later on in life. Everyone come out the woodwork. Do you know what I mean? But at that point, then I saw maintaining this image and my pride, my ego. I phoned. I was on the phone to someone in the morning, and they put someone else on the phone to me who I had trouble with, and he was like, "I got f- money on your head or something." And I was like, "Fuck it." And he was like, "Do you want to straighten?" I said, "Come then, let's go." I remember I was off my nut. I remember waiting outside the block early in the morning, like six in the morning, thinking, right, when you come out of the block, I'm going to attack them. And I had a tool on me as well. But luckily, my stepdad at the time, who was now with my mum, knew what I was doing. And he come flying around the corner in a van, get in the fucking van, what are you doing? Jumped in the van with him. But then the person who I phoned, who put me on the phone to, I thought, I'm not letting him get away with that. Do you know what I mean? This person, like, wasn't my pal, but it was like, you basically just tried to set me up and try and put someone onto me who's meant to be big, like, it was yeah. a face so I was like fuck that so when I went to it was in South Kilburn it was I went to South Kilburn about 4 o'clock in the morning I think it was 4 o'clock in the morning it was in the middle of the night anyway I went up there by bot- yourself on my own bottle in my hand been up for two days sniffed up as, as I said most of the crimes all the crimes I've done I've always been drugged up you know what I mean sniffed off my nut the normal me doesn't get involved in shit, do you know what I mean but when I'm on it anything goes man I don't give a fuck I'm on it innit? it like, it is what it is and I was uh, went up to South Kilburn I remember I had a supermodel bottle and my aim was wasn't to petrol bomb someone's house ever. It was to make it look like I was doing that. That image, you know what I mean? So I went yeah, there, yeah, yeah. put some water inside a super mop bottle, put tissue on the top of it, walked through South Kilburn, popped up outside the person's house, lit the tissue up like that. I didn't realise, but they got cameras in the area. So as I've done this, I've lit the cameras up. Oh, I was hoping that people would come to the window and see me and think, oh my God, fucking nut has come up here to petrol bomb us. I was never going to throw at anyone or anything. And as I've done that, old Bill come flying around the corner. I was like, oh my God. So I thought I smashed the bottle on the floor. I took off through South Kilburn. It's the most nutty, probably it was the most nutty story ever. I thought all I've got to do is get away. They haven't seen my face. I can pretend it's not me. Got around the corner. I dropped over some wall. I see a load of rubbish bags there. So I went over, emptied up one of the rubbish bags into a bush, put the rubbish bag bag over me. I swear to my <laughs> laid down on the floor like that for about five hours, like that, freezing cold. When I laid down, it was dark out. I remember the police at one point, someone was banging on the window. The police were t- holding a torch at one point saying, well, you can know you can see you then. I thought, just stay here, don't move, just in case. The dogs were out and everything. No one come near me. And next minute I started hearing a car drive away. Well, I must have been there for about three, four hours. Because by the time I left, it was light out. And then I was going back to my house, hiding behind cars still, trying to make my way back to the house. But then I was wanted. They had me on camera. I didn't know it was me. And at that point then, I was um, doing some 10-week drug course meant to be staying clean but the truth is I was turning up there sniffed up all the time you know did I mean? they not tell I used to um, well when you sniff you're quite alert innit if you're doing it all the time you'd look the same innit yeah, everyone can tell when your eyes are beaming no no what I mean is that I wasn't sniffing while I was walking in there I was sniffing the night before I'd been okay, partying okay, you know what I mean yeah, yeah. so I was doing tests and that but as long as you're turning up as long as you're turning up and you're showing that you're applying yourself the judges wouldn't put you back in jail or, or you get in trouble or you get put in prison so I'm turned up then I went there and I remember the key worker there said to me Barry he said look they said one way or the other you're going to get arrested for this so you can either and then I found my dad up my dad said to me as well the same thing he said look you can either carry on running but you're going to get arrested and you're going to go to prison anyway they knew it was you they said they knew it was you, you know what I mean the person who's in the house had told them who it was as well so I was like you know what I mean and the next day the police knocked on my door I remember I was wanting and I just, and I just accepted it myself I'm going to go to jail I remember the police knocked on the door I was like yeah come in brought me in and I was like yeah you've been arrested for attempted arson I was like alright sweet and I thought well, when they hear it's water in the bottle oh, sweet, sweet. Yeah. yeah like I mean they got the bottle on the floor 
So then I got, so I got to, so I got to, gone to, gone to um, jail. They, they obviously a serious charge. like we're putting you on remand. I was on remand four months, and then my barrister said to me, she said it's attempted arson. Like, and I, and I said, well, it was water. They've done the friend, done the check. Now it's come back that it was water. And my, my, my barrister said to me, go guilty. And I was like, bruv, I mean, it's a big sentence. Att- arson, arson. You're seen as like a real nutcase. Like to see someone burn yeah, yeah, yeah. is serious. Shit. But my, that was never my intention. That's why there was water in a bottle. Even though people think. The story all gets told now in the area, like lunatic went to put a petrol through some window. No, it wasn't. It was water. Do you know what I mean, I just wanted to make it, make it, make, make it look like that. But I've gone to court, and they said me, she says to me, yeah, but you still lit the tissue on fire. That's still an attempt. So I went guilty. I remember the judge walked out of the room. I was in jail for four months. It was Friday the thirteenth, August. It was, and my, all my family was there with me. I've been in jail for four months now, and it wasn't a good time in jail either. I was young. I was in jail, bullied a little bit as well. I wasn't wasn't the person I thought I was. Do you know what I mean, I got in there. There was some nutcases there put me in a cell with some geezer, I'm a little bit of an idiot, but I was in there and I wasn't really wasn't really about it and I thought this isn't really me. Yeah, yeah. So I went to court after doing four months in there on remand and uh, my family was all there and mate, I wanted to get out of jail so much and I was sitting there thinking, tempted arson, I think it was looking at about three or four years and um, but I wrote a letter to the judge, explained that and I was like, look, I went to a good school and, and, I, and I've always been able to hold on to that got good qualifications well, that, that don't well. solve the problem of trying, no, it doesn't, but the <laughs> trying judge, to blow the someone's judge, house up if they see that they might think like oh this kid does actually have an opportunity and in my letter I said like, look I've just gone down the wrong path so judge went look there's no way you're getting a DRR like you, this is a custodial what actually sentence. is that a, a drug, drug rehabilitation requirement it was back then okay and what does that what basically, is that basically you outside you get to go to this place on a daily basis or it's a rehab okay okay but in my area there, was no, there wasn't a rehab so it would have been staying at home basically I'm free do you know what I mean you get to go to this place every day you just check in, basically. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah, I'm good. yeah, yeah. And do what you do, do some course. So, I've, so I've, in my letter, um, just basically saying sorry. And he said, "There's no way I'm giving it to you." So let me go and read your letter. And he's as if before he walked, when he walked back, they tap on the door, didn't they? So he tapped on the door. Everyone stands up. And before he sat me down, he went, "I'm gonna, get, I'm gonna release you today in light of your letter." And I was like, "No way!" Yeah. And I was like, "Other, other table." Wait, was he, like, you got off with a whole charge because of your letter? No, no, no. He gave me a DRR. Yeah, but yeah, you yeah, got yeah. off for attempted arson. Yeah, I kid you not. And I, but the thing is. I was sitting there like, under the table. I was thinking KFC, McDonald's. I'm gonna go and have some normal food. And I was like, I couldn't believe Please it. Please don't tell me you went back to the same. And the judge said his words were, "I don't believe you're gonna stay out of prison. I believe you'll be back in prison soon. But in the light of your letter, uh, I'm gonna release you today because I think there's an opportunity." And 11 weeks later, I was back in jail. 11 weeks. 11 weeks later. You know, like genuinely, do people not learn their lesson? Honestly, truthfully, like you've just been let off. You've had that letter. You've wrote it. When I'm guessing, when you wrote the letter, you were sincere, no? I was sincere, yeah. But as I said, it's when you're brought back around the same environment and the same people, and now I'm full of ego as well. First time going, Joe, I'm the big man. Do you know what I mean? I come out and and for the reason why I second went the second time, the police officer even when they arrested me said to me, "Do you know what? They know people who themselves, their friends that have done the same thing." I caught my missus in bed with another man. For real? Yeah. What? Eleven weeks after. Eleven weeks later, you walked in and saw that. Walked in, the door downstairs was door downstairs was open a little bit. Walked in, she was in bed with some other geezer, and his leg was on top of her. What did you do? I ended up going to prison again. I don't want to say the ins and outs of what yeah, happened, but, but yeah. What, what did you go there, prison for? There was an altercation between us. Basically, I left. Then I got nicked for attempted murder. It went. I got got nicked for attempted murder. It got dropped all the way down to common assault. Um, between me and and over me and the girl, all three of us had an altercation in the house. The guy never said nothing to the police. I don't think he's even spoke to the police ever. I've actually met him a few years later, the guy, because his jaw was broken badly. And I think you know, what I, mean? you know, I, you know I, I actually know of the guy through family members now. But I actually met the guy a few a few years later. And when I do you know, what? I was actually sitting sitting in a, in, a, in a club like uh, during during the week, and I see him in front of me, and I recognise his face, and I was like. Do you remember me? And he was looking, he, I don't think he knew he was. And I, and I was in, I was with my Irish pen. I was like, look, get on the clock in case it goes off. And he was like, so he stopped and I was like, you don't remember me, do you? And I said, look, first of all, let me, can I talk to you? So this brother, I said, I've found out the truth now. He never knew that she had a partner. So this guy's had to end up having a tear out of me and his jaw's been broken. And he didn't even know. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, but like, listen, respect where respect is. No, I apologise to him, I apologise to him. I, I, I wouldn't have apologised in my defence. If I've walked in Not and many seen people that, would. if I've walked in and seen that, it's a long day. It's happened to me twice. <laughs> not the same I person even, either. I shouldn't even be not laughing. The same, not the same person laughing. either, mate. Listen, but listen, the first time it happened, I ended up going to jail. 
uh, charges got dropped down to common assault. I got six months to do free. How long was you looking for the attempted murder? Guys, have you been thinking of move to Dubai? I've partnered up with Cranbrook Legal to make your experience so much easier. Literally, I got the main man from Cranbrook Legal right now to tell you how easy it is. Guys, it's as simple as picking up the phone, giving us a call and letting us get on with the business. What, literally one phone call? Literally one phone call, a few documents and we're there. And then I just get up, fly to Dubai, and I ain't got to pay tax no more. Yeah, but you can come and see us. We'll take you out for a meal, show you Dubai, and then it's all up to you after that. Bro, where do I sign now? Mate, they, 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 that was just the arresting charge. And then okay. when they brought the thing, it got dropped to GBH for intent. Then it got to GBH, and then it's because they said there might have been a knife involved, and then they said there was no knife involved, and blah, blah, blah. But I ended up getting common assault. And the most craziest thing was, because of the DRR that I was on, so I got a year to do six months in a magistrate's court, which isn't allowed. Like you can only meant to only get maximum six months in a magistrate's court unless oh, unless the offence is an each way offence, which means it can go to a crown court. So while I'm in jail, three months into my sentence, the judges brought me back to court. Something and they said, right now they're going to resentence you for the attempted arson because you broke your oh, you broke shit. your condition. Remember, remember he yeah. said to me, yeah. so I'm back to court. And I'm thinking, I'm going to get three years or eighteen months, and now I'm back in jail now. I've realised now it's just, jail's just like school. You know what I mean? You have got to just stand up for yourself. Don't be a dickhead. And make it. And this time around in jail, I was alright. I stood up a bit more. Any for problems myself. in prison? Not this time around. No, it was sweet. The first I mean? time, do you have any proper yeah, problems? Yeah, first time I was very quiet. Do you know what I mean? People taking a, a little bit. Like, yeah, I was in cells with random people I didn't know. People who got no life, just taking a piss, bullying, my burn going missing, and shit like that. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, fair enough. But the second time around, it was different. I thought, fuck, I'll stand up for myself. Do you know what I mean? And I've and I've sort of come into myself a little bit now, and I'm in there for another serious charge. And um, where was we anyway? I can't remember what we were saying. We're talking about the, you walked in, you saw the, saw the missus, you got arrested, back to prison. Yeah, and then they brought me back to court for the, the arson, attempted arson. And the judge said, how well, the judge said, hold on a minute. He said, this guy's been in jail illegally because... What do you mean? The, char the charge I got nicked for, you're not allowed to get a year in magistrate's court. And he said, so, and he said, and the clerk in the court never said nothing. He said, this guy's been in jail for three months illegally. He went to me, as for the arson charge, don't worry about that then. And he went through it out, so I'm sitting there thinking, oh my God, he's... so basically I've gone from all these big sentences to having a small sentence. Yeah, and I got released three months in. And I was like, fuck, I couldn't believe You're it. You're the least luckiest guy. Mate, it's, it's God, God, God was watching over me, man. And I got released and then, um, sadly, over the, over the next nine years, I've done six years in prison, in and out, like a yo-yo. And what happened with you on New Year's Eve? Was that before or after you went back to that prison? That was after that. That was after, that was... Um, Basically, every single year from 2010 to 2019, I was in jail. It wasn't a single year, I'd done a year out. Or was it? I think you had a, previously someone on there saying they've been out a couple of months. Like, mine never went past six to nine yeah. months. Yeah, that's what he said. He said the longest time he's been out was nine months. So, like, well, time, time I left, every time I left prison, I thought it was on holiday. It was like, great, do you know what I mean? But in the what's back. The long, what's the longest you've been out? Now? I've been almost five years out. Apart from this? I think like nine months, max. The longest you had out? Yeah, nine since months. 2010, yeah, 2019. I was always on license, never left to leave the country. Last holiday I went on, obviously I've, I've been on a lot of holidays now, but the last two years I've been on loads, like hit some of my targets, my financial targets. But back then, last time I was on holiday was 2008. So I didn't go abroad for 15 years because I was always on license, not to leave the country. Always in jail, always taking drugs. Just basically banging in the middle of that lifestyle. Wow. And what happened New Year's Eve? New Year's Eve, I'd just done a year in jail. Um, I come out. I'd done an alcohol-related violence course in jail, so you'd think I'd come out and I would be like, back to normal, but this time I'd come out, I was a lump. I thought I was it. Um, I was out partying New Year's Eve. I knew it was going to be a crazy night. But was you still getting on it? I was still getting on it. And this, by this point now, my drug-induced psychosis was pretty bad. I'd already, I'd already had like a couple of mental health hospital stays. And I might not look like it now, but yeah, I had some serious, serious downward spirals like where hearing voices and crazy seeing things. When you've been up for sleep deprivation for days, Sooner or later, I started thinking I didn't know whether I was awake or dreaming in some days, you know what I mean? It was bad. But you was on it now for how many years? Um, now it'd been what, five to ten years, I think. Being on drugs for ten years, it's gonna fuck you up mentally. Well, it, it's over a long period of time, it's drug induced psychosis that kicks in periods of cocaine. At first, it's not like that for a couple of years, but then after long periods of time, sustained periods, it gets really bad. I didn't know when I did this, but now I'm just like, yeah, New Year's Eve, I was out, thought I was it. When I, I thought when I got shot, it was like in the middle of the night, but it wasn't. It was six o'clock in the morning when the, when the, the stuff with the paper come back a few days later. But my younger brother, God rest his soul, he passed away a month ago, two months ago now. Sorry to hear. Drugs, is, drugs and lifestyle. Yeah, same thing. My younger brother. He was at my mum's house, and I was at another party. I was in a nightclub in South Kilt, Belsize Road, um, that night. Ended up seeing someone I really didn't like this person, and I said to my pal who was running the club, I said, "Look, I said, 
can I go over and kick it off with him? And he was like, no, you can't do that. Before, and he, I said, right, and I'm out of a pal for pals there. I said, I've got a problem with him as well. And he said, all right, if you have trouble with him, I said, right, then I can, I can do what I want to do to him. Do you know what I mean? So I've seen him arguing my power out of the blue, and I thought, yes, <laughs> my opportunity. So I went over there and chinned him. And he's a bit of a face from the area. He's hit the deck, but all his family are there. And when I walked off, I said a couple of stupid things. Next time I said, I'll put a bullet in you. Walked off screaming and shouting. I think I might have laid, made a couple of messages on the phone to people as well, off my nut. Then I forgot all about it. Forgot all about it. Went to another house party. Same uh, night. Same night. Carried on partying. Forgot all about it. Then I thought, right, let me go and see my little brother. I've been out of jail a month. I haven't seen him yet. I go there. I will sniff a couple lines, have a couple drinks, and then I go to meet my pal over the over the bridge. My, my pal, God rest his soul, he's, he's died as well. My, my best friend. Go and see him over Labrador Grove. Um, I think he was at uh, that Hollyoaks pub. You know the one that Nick Pritchard owns at the time. Yeah, yeah. He was over there. So I was gonna. Done my third was go to my brother's house, see my brother. Have a couple of drinks with him, leave there, kill two birds with one stone. But in the process of that, I was getting phone calls from them. I don't know if it was from them or from someone. I was getting messages through um, from my ex-partner as well at the time. So and plus, I, a few weeks before that, I kicked off someone's door, robbed a drug dealers as well. So I was I was involved in madness. You know what I mean, my power. So and plus, the, the year that I was in jail for, me and my brother was in a house party and chinned someone, and the guy basically lost his eye. So I don't, it could have been basically any one of these. You four. chinned someone. Well, it's even me or my brother, in it? They don't really know. The guy said it was my brother. We don't really know what happened to Anushar. It was a he lost his eye. His eye crushed. Yeah. It was do, on, do you know it was what's on, mad? It on purpose. I look at you today and I don't see that guy. <laughs> I, no, <laughs> honestly, I, I, I don't see some criminal out there punching people up, selling drugs, sniffing lines. I don't. I just see a posh boy. Well, that's that's the good part of being five years clean, man. No, nah, 100%. You know I mean? no, you've got to be proud of that. Yeah. But yeah, so... Uh, Come out of jail, I've, I've got trouble everywhere. Everywhere I turn, I was in, I was in, even before that, before that being in jail, I was always in and out of fighting with everyone. Trouble, maintaining that image that I was trying to be, like that gangster lifestyle, thinking I was a gangster, and I'm far from it. And I was, uh, so New Year's Eve, I come out of my mum's house, walked up the road about 50 metres. Bam, two guys come out from behind the car. Pulled a gun out and I was like, fuck you, better fuck kill me. Sort of had an idea that it was going to turn up. I thought, fuck it, I'm still going. And I got shot in the stomach. I didn't even realise I got shot in the stomach. Like, in my head, I've got so many different variations of what happened that night. I was so high and the psychosis. So I don't really know the ins and outs of whether they come because of one of the incidents or it was another incident. Did you find out who it was after? Sort of. Not not 100%, you know what I mean? I no one never got nicked for it? Yeah, some got nicked for it. Some was in jail for six weeks and they got, they got out. They got out? They got out, yeah. Well, I, I, I didn't know. I didn't know. I'm not, not going to stand up in court and give no, it to someone, do you know what I mean? And it's like... <laughs> The guy put the gun to my head and it jammed up, tried to fire at me again. And when I was on the floor, this is what I remember in my head. And I, do you know what I mean? God knows this is the truth or not. But I remember jumping up and be like, you fucking shot me. And I didn't even know that you shot me in the stomach. So in my head, I was thinking, right, I need to get back to my mum's as quick as I can. I see the guy playing with a gun. So he's obviously, fucking, he's obviously jammed up and he's trying to unjam it, whatever. I've turned around and started running. It was crazy because while I'm running, I remember thinking if I run left and right, if he fires again at me, you're missing it. So you think you're in a and movie I'm, and or I'm, something. I'm bending over forward, thinking if he shoots, at least he won't shoot me in the back. Like he'll shoot me in the ass rather than. I can't even remember, but I remember running left and right, and I and I and I could feel the pain in my stomach. I knew I'd been shot, but I was still moving. I was thinking I'm not paralyzed. And as I hit the corner, I could see the back of my mum's bedroom window. I hit the corner, and my whole left of my body went. And I was like, Ugh, dropped to one side, sort of hopped to the front floor. Now I'm thinking these guys are gonna come running behind me. Just, I'm just praying they don't. I went banging on my door. My brother's answered the door and I was like, I've been f***ing shot. Went running in, collapsed on the floor. He ran straight past me, ran straight out to my mum's bedroom. I just I just turned around, sat there looking at my front door, just hoping they don't come running through the door. Just sat there looking, thinking they come, I'm just going to run at them or do what I've got to do in it. And it was like, they never come through the door. God willing, they never come through the door. And then my mum and I come down the stairs. It's like I was a wounded soldier. I'm looking around thinking, where's all the blood? There was no blood. So my brothers and that sort of like dragged me from the hallway so now I'm sort of collapsing, drag me into the front room. My sister hasn't come downstairs yet. I'm sitting on the side of the, of the floor, the dog bed there, with my head against the sofa. My sister's come in, sat down there. My mum's come down, still wearing her, her, her clothes. She's going frantic. Oh my God, oh my God. I'm looking down. There's a hole in, in, my, in my jumper there. But I'm looking around thinking, where's the fuck? Oh, you're not bleeding? No blood. So I'm thinking, where, wh what's going on here? Where's the bullet? My sister's like, where's the bullet? Wh wh where, where's the blood, sorry? So I look around, I thought, so I lean forward. Put my hand around like that. But I think it was like a tennis ball was coming out my back. My, the bullet had gone through me and hit me in the spine. So, and it shattered my spine. So it was like it was like feeling shards of a plate. You know what I mean? But and why is the blood not coming out? 
Well, the bullet never left my body. The bullet left my body. I'd have bled to death. Yeah, but it's gone in your body, no? Gone hit me here. Yeah. Through there. I'll show you. Look, yeah, but there's a hole here, no? No, there's a hole here, but it was all closed up from the from the heat. Must have been from the heat. It was. I couldn't. I couldn't. Uh, I don't know what to to explain it, but there was a hole there anyway. The bullet went through me there. Hit me in the spine. I could feel it hadn't left my body. If it did leave my body, I would have bled to death because I was on the floor for an hour and ten minutes before the police come. My mum phoned the police, ambulance, sorry, ambulance to come. But before the ambulance come, they said the police got to come with them. With oh, the response. Yeah, so they done that. They never come in a helicopter. Someone who was at the house party earlier turned up, walked in. Fucking hell, but what's happened? I'm on the floor. Like, I'm, I'm on the floor and I'm like, give me the phone. I'm going to phone this one them. And I was like, sitting there and I was like, I said to my brother, I got upstairs in my drawer, there's an eight ball of sniff. Go and grab it, get it <laughs> done. There's no way I'm dying. So I'm sitting there sniffing fucking lies of cocaine. Oh, you're sat there, you've been shot and you're banging I'm lines of I'm sitting there, my mum's going fucking nuts. I'm sitting there sniffing lies of cocaine. Disrespectful anyway. Uh, my sister's partner at the time walked in and had vomited everywhere. <laughs> and it was like, it was nuts. I'm sitting there. But then as I'm sitting there, as the time gone on, I started realising like I could feel myself going in it. And it was like, so I started making phone calls to my dad, saying goodbye. Oh, wow. So it started getting sad, yeah, man. I remember I phoned up my I tried to find my nan, I think it was. It took an hour and ten minutes for the ambulance mm. to come. When they finally come. That's a joke. The police officer walked in first with a gun, looking around, and then the two minutes come walking in, I was like, look, 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 look. Just be honest with me, man. Be honest with me, like, am I going to die? Be straight with me. And she was like, I said, look, don't bullshit me, like, I'm going to die. She went to me, I think you're too far gone. And I was like, fuck that, you must be nuts. I ain't dying. I'm staying alive, innit? And then. And I remember, well, that's what she said to you as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I, I, I sort of pushed her into telling me the, the truth, and I want the truth man what's going on here you know what I mean how far gone am I and she got her scissors out was, went to cut my top off and I was like fuck that you ain't cutting this top fuck and she I said these jeans are 400 pounds man I've been out fucking shoplifting and robbing and everything you guys are trying to cut my clothes off me I was like no so I've got my entire family standing on the dog bed pulling my jeans off me <laughs> with a bullet in my stomach like that <laughs> because, I don't, because I don't want to take my jeans and cut them because I'm so adamant I'm going to stay alive and then that was the last thing I remember. After I remember talking to her, then I woke up three days later in hospital. When I woke up, it was like I could hear like doop, doop. And I opened my eyes thinking, oh my God, it wasn't a dream, it was a truth. I looked down, I had like, I had 59 staples here, 209 staples uh, inside me, nine stitches on my back where the bullet had gone and hit me in the spine. Couldn't feel the left side of my body, I was laying there and I was like, oh my God. What the fuck has happened? The surgeon was sitting there, come in. I think they operated on me for I think it was fourteen hours, and he was like, "You're lucky to be alive." He said, "The bullet has gone through you, missed all your major organs, but hit you in the spine." And he said, "If it would have left your body, you'd have bled to death." And it's hit you in the spine where it's probably not you're not going to walk again on the left side of your body. It's gone. You might have to learn to walk again. He said, "I had one of them colostomy bags at the time," and I was like, yeah, yeah. "I'm walking, mate. No way." And then my pal come up to see me. I was like, "Help me up." And I remember it took me about an hour and a half just to get up to there like that. And they've said that you're not going to be able to walk again at this point. They don't, they don't feel like walking. I have to, I have to try, try and... Um, Learn again. Yeah, get my together. So I remember going, this, I'm getting up now. It took me an hour and a half just to get to there. And when I got to like there, I started vomiting. And all that come out was this black, black blood. About three or four buckets load. And all I remember when I got shot, and I know, I don't know sound like a mad story, but I remember real, real white, like the white as you've ever seen. I don't know if that was me going through the incubator machine or the flash of the gun or whatever, but I'm telling you, from when I see the darkness, I put f no. I remember seeing just pure whiteness, like the light, and I see all, see, see all, all the black blood, and I was like, help me up. And the guy who come up to see me, he was he was now crying, thinking, oh my god, yeah. Barry, f and I'm getting up on one leg and hopping to the toilet, like and I hopped in the toilet and I walked in, I looked at myself in the mirror and it was just my body was just drained and I was like. No man, I left you a month ago, bro. I was tunk. Look at the state of me. God, I've been shot. There's staples up here. I remember sitting on one of them things trying to shower myself. Come up. I had four police officers around me, solidly, for three days. People. I remember one of my pals come up to see me. I was, I was that man when I was there. Like, it was bad. I was sitting there thinking. Someone said, oh, you're going to go back to jail now. You're involved in violence. You're going to be recalled. And I was like, hold on a minute. I'm the victim of a shooting. I've been shot. Why am I going to jail? Yeah, one of my family members was like, it was in jail. Made the phone said Barry wants to watch him so he didn't get nicked. You know, if he's involved in violence, if he's involved in that lifestyle, and he just come off another violence charge, he's gonna he's gonna go back to jail. They recall him. I remember probation come up and see me. She was like, I said, I'm going back to jail. She's like, No, no, don't be silly. You're not gonna go to jail. Don't worry. Another one of my friends come up and see me. Funny story. And Billy would come up and he was like, But I need, um, these people that are after you, like, they might have done this. He said they got money. I said, Yeah, one of them have. And he went to be right. 
I remember him getting a newspaper. There's four coppers down there, and he was newspaper out the windows behind me in the hospital. He said they could be on the bridge over there. <laughs> so, you know, like, fair play to him, my, my traveller pal. Fair play to him. Look, and, and he was like, I was, I was cracking up, and, I, and they was like, mate, this, we're here, we're gonna be fine. And then the four coppers went away, and two normal coppers come walking in. Oh, you had four armed police officers. Four armed police officers, three day solid on eight hour shifts. So it must have been costing them a fortune, right? Yeah, definitely. To have around me, and and they also see me as just some. Hoodlum, do you know what I mean? I was never ever arrested for selling drugs or anything through the whole time I sold drugs. So I've never seen it that. Do you know what I mean? I also qualified as an electrician, worked as, as a senior letters negotiator. So I was never really seen in that lifestyle, but I sort of lived two lives. Do you know what I mean? So now I'm sitting in in in, in hospital and then two pieces come up and was like, uh, they said, 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 I remember talking to the doctors, all my family were gone. They leaned over and put cuffs on me. Boom. And I was like, oh my God. I was still on, I still couldn't even move. They took me in a stretcher downstairs and put me in the back of a police van. No oh, chance. God. Oh my God. Well, while you're on your bed, they're telling you you're going to be paralyzed. Later. Three days police have walked in and nicked you. Nicked me. They put me. The what police, was the charge? The, one of the police officers was. Oh no, recall. Were you recalled? Involved in. They, they, the police kept saying they was going to arrest me for something, but they never did. They put me in a stretcher. I was in scrubs for nine more months. I've been no charges. Nuts. I must have been the only one in the country ever been arrested for being put in prison for no charges. So you went to prison for getting shot? Pretty getting much. Shot, basically, because I kept my mouth shut. Otherwise, the other, the other people might have got 30 years. They owe me a big favour, man. I stopped them getting 30 years in jail. Imagine, imagine there's not many people out there who are going to get shot and to stop the people doing it to them doing jail and me not being seen as f***ing grass, keeping their mouth shut. And the way I saw things as well back then is like, just because I'm on the receiving end, now suddenly I can't suddenly roll over and... Hey, listen, you live by, you live by that game. The game when you're involved in that game, I mean, I'm not involved in that life no more, so things might have been a bit different now, but back then, I was involved in that. And at the same time, I'm not going to stand up in court and give evidence against someone who already done something or not and put somebody in jail for 30 years. Was that your last time in prison? No. no. Well, come on, I'm sure this is... When does it end? I've been back to jail for nine months. Um, picked my, I mean, at that, that time when I was in jail, it was hard as well. Really hard, because I remember I couldn't walk. Put me on a new wing. I was in the first night centre for three weeks. Like... They took staples out of me when I was in jail. When I finally come around, I even just about realised I was in prison. I was like, oh my God. And my licence finishes in September. I've got to do another 11 months. I was fuming. I was Did like, you not try appealing that? Yeah, I kept telling my front of probation. I said, what's going on? Like, and they were going to say, oh, the police have said they're going to come and arrest you. They have to keep you in there. But if I'm honest with you, it was probably the safest place for me at the time. I'm looking back now because yeah. I was involved in that life. So I'm going to go and do something back to where I think it might have been. And the next minute, I be, wouldn't be sitting I'd be doing life in jail. And and the truth is, while I was in there on that sentence, every time I every time I spoke about it, someone's like, "Oh my god, if that was me, I'd do this." You know, what it's like in jail. I know you've never been in jail, but if you haven't, but people are like, "Oh, oh I'll do this and I'll do that." So I'm listening to all this bullshit. And I'm thinking, do you know what, bro? I want to live a normal f-ing life, man. I'm sick of this place. I don't want to be f-ing spending the rest of my life in here because some f-ing idiot shot me. F- him on the straightener, I weigh him in all day long. And I'm gonna go and shoot him to prove myself because I'm hurt by what people think. And that's when I sort of grew up a bit and was like, do you know what? When someone says anything, I say I don't want to talk about it anymore. Yeah, you know I mean, and I thought, I'm, and I thought I'm going to stay out of that life. And if I'm going to get him back in ten years' time, when he's involved in another crime, and no one knows that it's me, and I'm living differently, then I do it. But in ten years' time, I might be married or living a completely different don't life. Don't say that now, mate. Something, no, might, happen to, something yeah. might happen to him next <laughs> week, and you get nicked no, for I it. No, can't. I feel well. Some of the people, they will, a lot of them are still back in jail. So, you know I mean, for other gun crime, but I mean, I just changed my life right now. And as I said, ten years later, I'm living a completely different life. I couldn't give. A shit. In fact, I've even phoned up people and apologised for my, my involvement in all that stuff because. I've played a part in it. If you're in a position where you have to come and put me away with a bullet, and then obviously I'm putting you in certain positions. Why did you go back to prison again? Um, crimes got shit after that. Shoplifting. A lot of violence still again. Common assaults. Last time I went to jail was for burglary. Common assault with my mum. And shoplifting charges. And what was the turning point for you? Where did you realise, alright, I need to turn my life around? Well, I, I come out of jail 2000 minutes after the shooting and that, and I was like... Come out this time and I was like, that's it, and I'm sorted. Come out, I had a life coach, just randomly found some paperwork in prison. His life coach been with me ever since, trailblazers they're called, banging. I was actually on ITV with him, ITV News, uh, Derbyshire show, Victoria Derbyshire show, a few years ago, when I was doing well. Got a job as a personal trainer, done, done, the, done, done the course, from me getting my fitness back together, yeah, yeah. I to walk in, I thought, I love this stuff. Got into fitness, passed the course, become a PT in fitness first, Salisbury Road, done really well for about six months, but in the background, I started sniffing again. Within six months, I'm back in jail. I think I was in jail for aggravated burglary, kicking on someone's door, fighting with someone while I was drunk, sitting there looking at 12 years. Ended up doing six months, and I think the charge got dropped or something happened. Bro, have you realised one thing here? You know, as we've gone through this story, 
every single time you've told me something, you get off with it. Yeah. Even down to getting shot, you survived it, missed every main artery in your body. You was meant to go to prison for an attempted murder. You done six months inside. You was meant to go to prison for the uh, every single thing in your life you've been lucky with. Mate, someone's watching over me, man. Did you not think at one point there's going to be a point where I'm no longer lucky? Yeah, when it's a point where I, where, where I finally gave in. Sitting on a canal, 2019, May the 11th. Been on, been at a two day party. Had like, I've been living homeless, but also sofa surfing anywhere I could go. That image that I created around myself had gone. Everyone was coming out of the woodwork. Someone had just knocked me out online and recorded it and put it on my net. It went, vi- it went viral, but it was all over the internet. Some man I was having trouble with from the area who was meant to be one of my close pals. I caused murders of him. He'd done the same with me. Sort of split the area into two. I was just taking mad drugs. I was smoking crack here and there. Do you know what I mean? Like, and from someone who's sniffing to cracking, smoking crack, ain't really seen as a good thing no, in the don't. area I'm from. Everyone looks like, like you're trapped, you know what I mean? You know what it's like? And it was like, I remember sitting on a canal thinking, I've got nowhere else to go. I can't go to my mum's house. Got no one's gonna no one's opened the door for me. I remember sitting there thinking, bro, I'd prefer to be in jail now. I was wanted for multiple charges. God knows how many charges I wanted for unfortunate. When you're looking at prison as the light, and that's when you bed, know something's wrong. That's when I thought, bro, and I sat there thinking, bro, I was personal training two years ago, looking at making hundred k a year. Okay, I went to London Oratory. Do you know what I mean? I was a senior letter negotiator. How have I ended up back here again? And I found him thinking, I was going to walk to the petrol station, but I thought that was an open tour. Um, the one around the corner was a shop there, Tesco's Express. I was an open tour nine o'clock. Might I say, I might not be enough if I knew the right time that a shop was actually opened at 6 a.m. I'll see it the other day with my missus and I was laughing. She was like, I'm just laughing. I said, if that, if I realised that time that opened, I might have come here and stole some drink and carried on drinks. I sat on the canal and I thought, I've had enough, man. How have I got here? Do you know what I mean? Just, I've just been arguing with my mum. So I knew the police was outside my mum's house and I thought enough's enough. I actually done a reel on this and I got quite a lot of views on it as well. And I thought enough's enough. I went and went and handed myself in to the police station, but this time for the first time ever I knew where I was going. I knew what I was doing. I said, I'm, I'm gonna get clean, I'm gonna get off the drinking drugs and avoid this lifestyle. I went to jail, got lucky. I went I remember I went up in front of the judge and it was it was mad because I was in um in the cell downstairs and it was like it was people after me, so I thought, right, if I end up in Wandsworth I've got to try and stay on the, on the entry ring for the first six weeks don't get in there because I've got people after me because someone's going to find out I'm there people come through the door and I'm thinking right I could survive six weeks on the entry ring keep keep my keep my head down so I sit and I thought right I'll do that I'll do my sentence I'll probably get four years do two I'm trying to work out what I'll get with my sentences for yeah. the crimes I've done I'll do two years I can handle two years I'll be clean but everyone I'm... becomes a solicitor in prison isn't it? <laughs> so, but I'm working this is what I'm head thinking well and it was like I'd gone from being sitting there and shit on my clothes wearing grey prison clothes, got no clothes, no home to go to, nothing. Looking up and I was like, you know what, I can do this, man, I can get better, I can get well. And I, went, I slept properly. I went, and the next day I went in front of the judge and uh, they, they, I said, judge, can I talk? Can I open, talk openly? And I said, look, every crime I'm up against, I'm guilty. Just spoke openly. And he was like, I said, I'm a drug addict. I said, if you release me now, I'll keep taking drugs. I'll keep committing crime. You released me a month ago. I'm meant to be on tag. I'm not even wearing a tag. And he was like, I said, yeah. And he said, look, I admire your honesty but this is going to be a custody sentence. So I was trying my best to try and get them to speech them. So they go to Rio, yeah. and I sent them the same old story, all my professional letters, went to a good school, <laughs> seen your letters, negotiate. And it was great. And it was like, look, all your paperwork has gone past it now. And he was like, look, he said, and I said, look, rather than sentence me to send me to jail for, for remand and for all the paperwork and all that bullshit they usually do and sitting there with anxiety, oh, what am I going to get? What am I going to get? Just sentence me now, get out of the way. And he said, right. So I looked at all, he said, and I'm, I think I'm looking at around 18 months, do nine. And I was like, he looked at me and he was like, so my sister went to me, what do you think? And I was like, I'm, Sweet. Happy, I'm happy with that. <laughs> I was like, 18 months it is then. Nine months, that it? Got 18 months, do nine. And then on top of that, I got put into Thameside, which is like private, you know, it's like a women's show, isn't it? What, Thameside? Thameside is like a hotel room? Yeah. It's like a hotel, literally. So it's like a holiday lucky. inn. So, and I knew from the crime that I committed, that's where I'd end up. So I thought, right. So I got to Thameside, then I made it all the way to like the enhanced wing. Remember I was in there, I was in there, with, um, I, got in, I was in a cell with an IPP, my pal, um, Shane. Proper nice guy, and he, and he, you know, he told me a few things because I said, and he said he'd been in there since since he was like twenty one. He got released once, and put back in there, and he was in there because of gambling or something in the bookies, and he pulled a knife out, and he got, and, he, and his mum passed away a few weeks after he was in jail. He's only twenty one, and I felt proper sorry for him, like, and he was telling me a story, and it was, um, yeah, was was sitting there, and he was, and he was telling me he had, a daughter, he had a daughter at home, and he was saying to me like he worked at Tesco's or something, got Asda or something, and I was like, what? He was like, oh, all right, you're too good. Working a place, and I was like sitting there thinking, and he's like, I'm sitting there thinking, I'm, I haven't really, I haven't acknowledged it yet. I'm fucking homeless on the street. I'm smoking crack. I'm yeah, bad on real. drugs. Like, and I'm sitting there saying this guy, where you go, and he's going, listen, when you've done enough time, you'll work anywhere. And I was like, he said, no, so why don't you come and get a job with me, done the laundry? And I was like, 
fuck that, bro. I went to the laundry. He said, bro, I said, I'm the supervisor down there. I'll get you a job there tomorrow. And I was like, you know what? All right, sweet. So when I got a job the next day, and you know what? It's probably the best thing I've ever done because it started me from scratch. I had no clothes, nothing. Bro. You never went back to any of that shit? Never, ever again. I've been clean ever since. I come up when I was in jail, got myself better, started writing how I ended up going through that to one of the best schools in Britain to now sitting in the prison, being shot, multiple charges. How am I sitting here now? Trying to figure it all out. Um, and I, I, there was no accurate plan for me to go to rear at the end of the sentence. I said, Mold, make this all happen myself. So I'm sitting in the cell. Like there's a phone in the cell, so I'm making phone calls. And then luckily enough, my paperwork landed on top of my old funder's desk from three years ago, just by chance, December the 5th. He seen it. And I phoned up, he come on the phone to me and he was like, well, I'm coming to see you in five days. He come to see me in the, in the jail, walked in, he was like, look, I've got a rehab for you. The same rehab I was going to send you two years ago, but you said you're not going there because you thought the place was a <laughs> in a hole. You know what I mean? I'm choosing how I'm going to get well, but I'm fucked. This, this is the issue, isn't it? Unless you're fully willing to get clean and do anything, it's not going to happen. So I was like, look, I'll go anywhere. This is your job, like trying to butter him up. Get me wherever, I'll go wherever you want. He said, he said you'll change hole. You'll do really well. And that's what happened. I got released January 15th, 2019, 2020, sorry. Um, come out went to rehab and hole on my own well look it's only been three years well four years now 2024 and you're smashing it yeah I've done alright I've done alright listen you got to take credit where credit's due you've, you've smashed it right yeah you went from being a crackhead cokehead drug addict involved in crime to you're a successful businessman you're an entrepreneur you, you're doing well for yourself doing alright yeah Talk to us about the positives in the positives in your life. I got um, it started. Do you know what? To be honest, with you, it started in prison. In the last one, my initials are BOS, right? Barry O'Shea. So I thought the initials are quite good, like they're quite unique. And I thought, right, I'm good at exercise, I'm good at selling stuff, I can go back into property and make lots of money, but I know exercise will keep me clean, and I can't go back to my old area. So I need to avoid that. Wherever rehab they send me to in the country, I'm staying in that area, and that's what I've done. I've stayed in Hull because the whole the whole area is like is like my serene town, so. I thought, right, well, I'm going to get into exercise. I'll go back into property later on in my life. So I thought, how can I, I want to start my own business. I thought I'll graduate from the drinking drugs and I'll just start doing personal training outside in the park. Because I got no money to buy equipment. I ain't got no money to go to, to go to a gym. So I started studying calisthenics while I was in jail. Yeah, yeah. So for the last six months of my sentence, I go to the gym and just do solely calisthenics, reading books on it. And I come up with the name Boss Fit, Barry O'Shea Super Fit. I thought it sounds the same as CrossFit. It could work. And yeah. I thought... But the name Boss Fit must have been used. I thought if I started, someone else was already going to have the name. And I was right. So I thought I'd put another name beneath it, Academy. It sounds bigger than what it is, right? So then after I graduated in the rehab, after six months, they were meant to put me in like a townhouse. And they said, no, they can't because my violence is too bad still. You need to um, earn, earn, earn your place first in society in here and you to stay at the rehab. So I ended up staying in rehab for 16 months. Like, I'm probably one of the longest people ever to be in rehab. But while I was in, after six months, I graduated, I was in the rehab. My pastor said, brother, if you're here now, you might as well start your business now. Yeah. yeah. So I started a class in Hull. I didn't know a single person in the park for, for like for six weeks solid and no one turned up. <laughs> and I was like... Well, you were there by yourself, just doing it yourself. Turned up there every week on a Sunday and no one turned up. And I was there and I was just like... And then I started a WhatsApp group. It's called Free Boss Fix, Free Boss Fix Academy. And it's, it's still on now. WhatsApp group's still open now. I've got like over 200 people in it or 100. I don't know. I've got people in it anyway. I started a free group and I thought, if I get three people a week in there, six months' time, 78 people. So like, And then from there, obviously a percentage of that would definitely be warm leads. And I, can, and I remember my entrepreneurial schools were from selling drugs and, and making money in, when I was in school. So I can do all this stuff. So I started a WhatsApp group and I started looking at the, the pricing for personal training in whole, which is quite cheap. And I thought... How much is it? It can be anything from 15 to £40 pound an hour. Oh really? And I, yeah, and I, and, yeah, and I was used to personal training in London with some some high profile members, 100, 120 pound an hour in Wembley. Do you know what I mean? And 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 in fitness first, so it was like I wasn't looking at it. And I thought I'm in rehab. I'm still doing body weight movement. Um, so I studied online coaching, and I generally didn't believe online coaching could do anything. I was like, oh, you have to be there with a person to train them. I couldn't do it, so I launched the online business and the personal training. I even sold Herbal Life at the beginning. Oh, mate, allow it. <laughs> I sold Herbal Life. Herbal life. Sold Herbal... You know why I sold Herbal Life, though? Because they give you a free mentor and they teach you how to do things online. Are right? they still, still around? They're still around, yeah, yeah. Jim Rohn, who owns it? I don't want a sponsor from Herbal Life, but you're shit. <laughs> but basically, the reason why I've done it because they teach me how to, use, you, to teach you how to do things online. I couldn't even copy and paste a message. So I've done it. I started doing my posts. My posts at first were like, hi. <laughs> Remember, which I didn't say earlier, I lost six stone in six months while I was in jail as well. Six stone in six yeah, months? Years, years, years ago Sweet. as well. And I, I, I remember I'm, I'm an addict, right? So my addiction is like anything. So when I'm in jail, you know, I, wouldn't, I never took drugs while I was in jail either. Uh, on the second to last one, I might have done a, a bit here and there, but I was, I, so it was food. 
so by this time when I got to jail, I was like, that's it, I'm going to come out a different man. Done done six months, done six, only six, done six months. And this time when I was there, I thought, right, I could study calisthenics, do online coaching, I'll be a weight loss specialist. And then I picked up my first client on December 31st, uh, 2020, going to 21. And then I picked up like one a week from there. And it was like, and that's when that's when COVID hit and the gym's closed. So who do you go to? You go to someone who specialises in body weight and someone who works outside the gym, right? And that's what I was doing. So my, my list just went bigger and bigger. Then I started doing, selling these packages online. In my first month, I made 35 pound, literally. And if I gave up, right? Imagine when I gave up doing them classes because no one turned up because I felt bad. But if I kept on going, I had nothing in it. Like when I went to Rio, I had 14 pound in my pocket. And my clothes were from a bin. I got my clothes from the laundry in prison. So I turned up with nothing in it, but I had a dream in my head. I didn't know nobody. I basically built my entire business from social media. Do you know what it is as well? You've got to start somewhere. You can't, even down to the podcast, I started this. My first video didn't get 100,000 views. Yeah, it goes. Like, it got a few hundred views and I was sitting there. I was like, I just want to hit 1,000. I swear, <laughs> that's all I wanted was just to hit 1,000. Give yourself them targets. Even when I was working in the restaurant, I was making the workers make Gmail accounts to subscribe so I could hit 1,000 subs. yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and it, do you know what? It's so mad because if I would have stopped when I had done my first video, I wouldn't be here today. Like I wouldn't have the show, the setup, the studio. But same thing for you. You went six weeks turning up to a park. Like it was a free class. The class was free. <laughs> no one was even <laughs> no turning, turning up. up. And then, yeah, and then, be- imagine, I, I was buzzing about getting people onto my free WhatsApp group. Yeah, because I also knew when I played rugby years ago, there was 190 people in the group one time. And some guy put on the group that, his mum just kicked him out of his house and I got a place saying six people got back to him quickly and I thought, bro, this would be a really good, like, if you wanted to sell something, get yeah, a group yeah, like this. So I put, I said, all the little things in my life would come together, like being shot, I wouldn't become a PT when I got shot, the WhatsApp group stuff, the fitness, the salesman stuff, it all sort of piece of puzzle finally come together, got rid of the drinking drugs, so now I just left as me, my entrepreneurial and the academic side to me and I put my all into it. I remember I had, I had nothing else, right? I got nowhere to go. I'm living in a rehab. I have to make it work where I am. When you put all your eggs in one basket, it's got to work. And my competitive nature is I want to be the best, no matter what it is. Do you know what I mean? That's why, that's why I ended up in, in one of the best schools. That's why I got great results. And whether, even if it's selling drugs, I've done pretty well because I'm quite competitive nature in me. Have you had any points where you've nearly gone back? I had a relationship breakup. Um, my brother passing away, but never, man. Never, ever bad enough for me to the point. I went to the pub once and bought a pint and sat down and looked at it in front of it. And then I took a photo of it and sent it to the person. And I was like, and I realised that I only, only done it just to piss them off to say, look what you made me do. And have you ever drunk since? Never, not once, not once. Never even drunk? Never. Wow. I'm four and a half, I'm four, four months time, I'm five years clean from everything from that from that moment on the canal. That's big. But you have to understand for 15 years, man, I was hardcore, <laughs> do you know what I mean? So. Yeah, but you know what it is? 15 years hardcore, some people don't make it. Like, yeah. there's been plenty of people who have been killed. You nearly was one of them. Yeah. Very lucky. There's people who have overdosed and just gone lost them there's been so many things where people ain't been as lucky as you well they, they say it's if you if you're an addict it's either jails institutions and death and i basically did all three mental health been there mental health stays twice thames ward st charles i was there for weeks on end like nuts jail loads of times do you know what i mean six out of nine years in prison and i got shot almost died basically do you know what i mean so it's like basically i did someone's watching over me and then so i went to hole saw myself out and What's life like for you right now? Um, I hit a financial target about 80 months ago. I went to Dubai for my first holiday. I was like, do you know what? That was your first holiday? First holiday, Dubai in Jamira Hotel. <laughs> so I thought I was a man. Dubai's lifestyle, no? Mate, I was, I was sitting there and it was like, I thought, my pa- I was saying my parents, bro, if you're going to go on holiday, and I started thinking, rather than going to Benidorm or Spain or somewhere, there's nothing against them, but that's the usual holidays from, from English people. And I thought, do you know what? Let me do something proper. I looked up and promised me, why don't you go to Dubai? And he sent me a link to the Jamira Hotel. Didn't know where it was. I clicked on it and I booked it. I was going in seven days. And he was like, you going? I went, I'm going. I remember I got off the plane and it was like, boom, the heat hit me. And I was like, right. This when did you go? What month? Um, June the 11th, I think, or 10th. I'm not sure. It was roasting. Hot. <laughs> it was roasting. <laughs> that was hot. I remember, I remember the hotel was, well, it's mad. The hotel's like a building on the side. Like there was eight restaurants in there. The meals, like it's just, the service is so good. A lot of the stories you hear about Dubai being this, being that, it's all, a lot of it's rubbish, man. I went and opened my fridge up and it was just full of alcohol. Do you know what I mean? When so, did you go to Dubai? June. What year? What year we now? 24, 20, 22. Okay. Yeah. yeah. But it was... um, it was, It's it was, different life out there, no? Yeah, mate. I remember going into the city like, and going, going on like a boat trip on an excursion. And I was thinking, how did they build this town in 16 years? 
They had like people on day night like, when the police was on shift for me. That's what they had your people there, innit? Coming over there. Dubai is. It, 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 the service is so good. It's such a nice town and it, it's proper, man. It's proper. It's the way to go. It's where to be. That's where you should inspire to be if anyone's going to do something. Do, do you know what it is as well? And I've always said to myself, if I ever go broke, I swear it touch don't happen, but if I ever go broke, I'm moving to Dubai. Because you can't be broke out there. No. Everyone is doing so well. You can't just be a bum. You can't sit there and be... A, you, there's work all around you. Well, if you're selling an online product as well, you can live anywhere you want, right? I mean, since going to Dubai, I mean, I've been on five holidays here. I'm going to Barcelona on Monday. Fair enough. So it's like... <laughs> And I'm going with, with my partner, so anniversary, it's been a year since we've been together. So I thought I'd book Barcelona, but yeah, it's just nice. I hit my financial target, went to Dubai, um, and just started, thought I'd start traveling. So, traveling what does your around. business consist of now? I hope, it took me a year to build my first gym, and my gyms are one to one training only, not open for commercial public. Really? Yeah, so that way it's only like, because um, I specialize in weight loss. A lot of people come in there who are overweight and yeah, they're yeah. quite insecure, nervous. You know I mean, and, and, I, and I target. Parents mainly, but I've only just franchised my brand, so I've got a lot of coaches now working under me. But but when I first started, I built my first gym. It was one to one, pretty much like a studio. It took me a year to build it, and then it took me three weeks to build my second gym. And I wasn't even in the, in, the, in the same city because of knowledge, right? Once you get the knowledge to do yeah, something, yeah. once you got the recipe, it's fine. Yeah, I got Entrepreneur of the Year, Runner Up Entrepreneur of the Year, twenty twenty one. I don't know what the name of the company is. If they give it to me, but it was yeah, it's a big big achievement to have. But but if I'm saying like I work extremely hard when I did when I first started not as hard anymore if I'm leveraging my business but when you're running your own shit, you got to I'm up at 5am bed at bed at midnight working hard man and that's, that's all it was right what's your five year plan just franchise my brand what is your brand called Bo- and now it's called Boss Fix Academy Boss Fix it used to be Boss Fit now it's called Boss Fix because someone else had a company called Boss Fit when I registered it so I had to change it around and I just I think Barry, o- Barry O'Shea Super Fix Mm-hmm. It's quite a good name, I think. Um, Boss Fix Academy, franchise a brand. I had a clothing a clothing brand as well. It's doing extremely well. Um, but I just come up with a massive legal battle with probably the biggest clothing company in the world. If who? you can, I can't say who. Cause I'm not to sign paperwork. You can say the name and I'll bleep. Well, you can. Well, work it out from my name. You'll work it out yourself from my name. Okay. All yeah. Right, and because enough. of that, I, I, um, what was your brand called? Same name. My company name. Boss Fix Academy. Fair enough. You yeah. wonder why you got in trouble. <laughs> and the funny thing is, I actually wear their clothes all the time when I read the letter from them saying, I would say to people, say, yeah, they're going to phone me one day and ask me to be their fitness brand. But and you know what the best thing is? Even though, fair enough, you got f***ed by them, but the fact they've reached out to you, this is to me, great. that's an achievement. Mate, that's I remember it. sitting there going, why are you so happy for I said, bro, they're messaging me. I said, they're afraid of me. Like when I started the clothes part, you have to understand, so I'm doing online coaching, personal training, direct him to start my own gym up. And I thought, but back then when I was doing the class, I remember one day I found someone who made who made t-shirts, right? But they had fruit of the loom on the t-shirt labels. So yeah, I thought, yeah, yeah. let me buy 10 t-shirts off him. I put all my signing on money into buying 10 t-shirts. Got my name across it, Boss Fit Academy. Brought it to my class. And I had to put a, a cup down on the grass for donations. And I put the 10 t-shirt there, And everyone bought a t-shirt off me. 15 pound a t-shirt. So I made five pound each t-shirt profit. I go home, I wrote it down, like tracking my progress, thinking this is great. And I'm the same thing as you, like, one day I make my first thousand pounds from doing this, my first two thousand. And next minute, two years later, I'm getting I've got manufacturers in Pakistan, three batches a year, 30, 40 K pops. And it's like I'm sitting thinking, no one knows the ins and outs of me walking 15 miles to sell a pair of leggings, yeah, and making no profit because I have to pay for the bus home. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, With nothing bad. to rehab. But when you put that work in at the beginning, it pays off in the long run, right? I remember sitting there thinking, this will pay off one day, man. Just keep doing it because it's just awareness. I thought if people are wearing my clothes and I've had phone calls from people like in Fulham and I'm all the way in Hull now. So I'm just got in my cab wearing your clothes. I'm like, yes. <laughs> when I'm walking through the town centre and someone walks towards me wearing my tracksuit, they don't even know me and I'm like, yes. Uh, listen, it's, it's, it's a good feeling. Especially when you see someone wearing your product, yeah, nothing beats it. But I've had to stop selling the clothes because of my... Uh... Can't you change it a little bit? Yeah, there's, I don't want to say too much on it, but there's, there's obviously ways around it. I can't drop drop something that's bringing me big income. And I love I loved the clothes as well. I mean, one day, who knows? There'll be, there'll, I don't one day, there will be sports shops around soon with my brand massively. It's only a matter of time. So is that part of the five-year plan? Five-year plan, uh, yeah. I mean, my, my, my aim, my goals are massively high, but... Tell us. I target parents, right? I work with parents. And within my academy, there's a lot of um, spiritual stuff, like... Have you done something good today? Have you helped someone? Yeah, yeah. Have you looked at yourself? I follow a spiritual program now. That's why I'm still clean. Like I do it, follow a twelve step program, and and part of that means I have to help people. And I, I mean, it's, it's what 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 makes me stay clean. And and I've also developed a business that does the same thing. So if I target parents who who are following the principles of my recovery and principles of, of my my academy, that would then follow suit into their children. So in ten twenty years time, their children will all be living by 
the boss fix principles and hopefully I change an entire generation, right? Crime rate drops and everything goes better. That's the plan. Well, if you if you drop crime rate, you're going to be very powerful, <laughs> man, because... No, I, I want to get into politics in a couple of years as well. I'm trying to. One day I will, but at the moment, I want to just franchise my brand. So I'm going to get, get more awareness on my company by getting more coaches. I've moved pretty fast. I've seen it. I'm in the, in the, in the papers. It's like I've seen as one of the best coaches in the country. Someone in the newspapers has said it. I've had quite a lot of high profile clients and celebrities. Who's been your most high profile client? I don't want to start dropping names. Go on, tell us. That's, <laughs> no, what, we, no, that's what we're on the show for. Yeah, but you know what? I've had, I've had people recognize me and put up on their stories on Instagram. Like Callum Best do it. Scotty T from Geordie Shaw. Okay. I've had a couple paid free girls. Um, my good pal Scott Shearsmith done it as well. I've had um, Cash from Top Boy. Oh yeah, yeah, he's on there as well. Ash, um, yeah, there's a, there's a few more in the pipeline as well that are in there. And I've actually got someone I can't really say the name either. I have to talk to her first. But I've been with me for six months. Who's done? Who was huge in the papers six months ago? Who's been with me for six months? What were they in the papers for? I can't say. You know, it's true. Fair, I can't say. Fair, yeah. fair enough. Fair but enough. yeah, it's all these people are. Um, and plus, I live in an area where, like. You got all, all a lot of famous people going my area. You got Fredo on one side. You got AJ Tracy on the other side. I know all AJ Tracy's friends. All my good pals as well. Well, some of the people I work with him. You got Fredo on my area. There's a lot of famous people that come from my area. Do you know what I mean? I didn't realize what my area was like until I move out and get another culture. No, there is quite a lot of people in London. Do you know what I mean? And that, but London's been, London. Been very lucky to move to another area though up in Hull because the culture is completely different. It's a lot more relaxed and slower, which is what I need. Because when I'm in London, it's all fast paced. Everyone's trying to get ahead of each other. But you know what is a good thing with you is you've got the London vibe in you. So in Hull, you're the fastest one in Hull. Oh, so I got an urban attitude, and I brought that to Hull, and it's, that's probably why I've done well in business and my tenaciousness to push and yeah, get things out there. Th- nothing's faster than London. In London, you've got to be at 100 miles an hour all day long. But it's, it, the thing is, in London, what I see is that they mix a lot of rich people with poor people in the same area. And because of that, that's why you get a lot of crime and drugs yeah, and everyone, just, everyone's shooting each other to get ahead. It's still like that now in my area. Do you know what I mean? Everyone's, everyone's fighting each other to make a pound note doing the wrong thing like I've managed to do what I'm doing the legal way I've got no one chasing me anymore no one trying to shoot me pay my taxes and I'm pretty sweet do you know what I mean and it's the best I've ever been have you had any problems from the past I've bumped, in, I've bumped into a few people but nothing that's kicked off nothing has kicked off a lot of people are part of the program I follow you've got to apologise to people for what you've done and, anything, and that way then after that and things happen in a moment you apologise in a moment whether you're right or wrong and, and it's like before I live my life incorrect yeah no matter what I've done I was always looking for a shortcut Mm-hmm. Do it this way, do it that way. Do you know what I mean? I was, I was raised that way. People around me doing the same thing. But now I've been living life correctly, living by principles, rules. My life's flourished. And I think, fuck, and it's not even that hard just to live correctly. To live by, the, live by the law and the rules isn't that difficult. But if you're hanging around with idiots and you're doing the same thing with everyone, it's no wonder you end up in a bad situation, right? Well, look, i got to say, you're definitely by far the luckiest guest I've ever had on my show. <laughs> Like genuinely, you 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 just slip your way in and out of prison. You like got, you got to make your own luck. <laughs> <laughs> no, listen, you're very very lucky, but you're smashing it now, man. You're doing well. You got to be proud of yourself as well. Like yeah. there's a lot of people who are struggling to overcome addiction, and I hope this podcast helps people out there who well, are. If there's anyone out there who wants, who want, you don't need to be. Um, give me, drop me a message, man, on Instagram. Drop me a call. Drop me a message if you come out and you ain't got employment. Drop me a message. I'll help you as best way I can. Anyone. Uh, like, I've been, I've I been always say the best thing is as well. You've experienced that. You're not a teacher in school who's teaching business, who's got no business. You've done it all. You've been an addict. You've been shot. You've been involved in crime. You've now turned your life around and you're doing better for yourself. Mm-hmm. So people out there looking up to you, they can actually look up to you now. You're not still that well, that's, wrong. That's the good thing about it is that I've been on both ends, right? I've been I've been in the shit, in the dirt, been with the lower class. I've been with the higher class. Do you know what I mean? And and the image that I tried to create at the gangster shit was never really me. It's just the image that I created to f- survive in that world. The truth is, I was an academic, and I've gone back to doing what, what I'm good at. Yeah. I'm doing pretty well, and and, I, and now I get to help people as well, which is, which is great for me as well. Do you know what I mean? Even though the, the business is growing, it's doing, doing, doing. I'm real, but a lot of things I realise, a lot of it is, it's not even about the money anymore for me. A lot of it, I just, I just like f-ing helping people, man. It makes me feel good. Once you, once you've conquered and you've achieved such a certain financial figures and that, it's like money's a bonus. Yeah, what you want from there, you just want time. You want to enjoy yourself, right? Do you know what I mean? The, the money's, the money's there, so it removes the pressure from you, and now it's just. But enjoying yourself is why I've, why I've been on a lot of holidays this year, and it's why I'm getting married. And well, congrats, and so forth. Yeah. No, listen, you could just listen. Keep focusing on what you're doing. You pretty much got the recipe for success right now. Keep right. smashing it. Keep helping people. A little bit of advice for the younger generation: talk to the cameras. Um, hang around with the right people. Hang around the right people, and you'll get the right results. You look around at your three closest friends on your WhatsApp. And you're the average person. If they're all idiots, then John's not an idiot. <laughs> Well, listen, it's been a pleasure having you on the show. I hope you've enjoyed it. 
Where can the viewers find your socials? What's your socials? Uh, Instagram, Boss Fix Academy. Uh, the same on TikTok as well. Yeah. Or my website, www.bossfixacademy. Well, listen, pleasure having, you, uh, pleasure having you on the show. It's been a pleasure, Mike. And we'll see you soon. Thank you very much. Guys, make sure you like, comment, and subscribe, and we'll see you on the next one.